have come to the end of our systematic study of the book of Revelation that we call the unveiling of God's plan for humanity. We're going to read the epilogue of the book today found in the 22nd chapter of Revelation verses 10 to 21. Uh, and we're going to look at a summary of all the truths that we've investigated so far that we encountered in the last 47 weeks. And uh, you may recall that in the beginning of our study, in chapter 1, verse 3, God promises to bless those who read and hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it. So we're going to do just that in order to be blessed. I want to share with you today 10 practical ways to be blessed by applying apocalyptic truth. Because this is what we're going to talk about, apocalyptic truth. And we're going to move very fast. So uh, make sure you catch up here with the notes. The first one, the first way to be blessed by applying apocalyptic truth is we proclaim his revelation. We proclaim his revelation. Verses 10 uh, through 11 says this. He said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is near. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong, and the one who is filthy still be filthy. And let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. Now these are the words from the revelating angel, the revelator, the angelic being who was talking to John on behalf of God. And he commands John to not seal the book with wax, which would indicate the closing of the book or the restricting of the contents of the book. But God doesn't want to restrict the content of the last book of the Bible. This is an open book. Um, and what that communicates to us is that the contents of the book are available to everyone who wishes to read. If you want to know God's program for the future, all you do is you open the book. Because the title of the book, you may remember from week one, is The Apocalypse. It's the transliteration of the Greek word apocalypsis, which means an unveiling, the uncovering of, uh, of revelation here. This is an open book. Like the rest of the Bible, this is active and living and sharper than any two-edged sword. The last book of the canon is, uh, uh, is open because it not only reveals the future of mankind, but addresses our present condition. For this reason, church, pastors and preachers who refuse to preach the book of Revelation are actually withholding truth from their congregation. They are doing the exact opposite of what the angel is commanding John to do here on behalf of God. Because God's purpose is not to conceal, but to reveal, making truth accessible to everyone. And it is our joy to proclaim that truth, to proclaim that revelation. The book must be uh, proclaimed because, again, God's purpose is to make truth known. Now, although written primarily to bond servants of Christ, you may remember that from the beginning of the book, every person in the world, even non-believers, will benefit from reading the Revelation because the book demonstrates the holiness of God, His majesty, His power, and the kindness of God who saves, unrepent who saves repentant sinners and judges unrepentant transgressors. You may notice here that the expression, the time is near, appears in the beginning of the book and also at the end of the book, therefore bracketing uh, the divine truth of Christ's return. Now, we don't know exactly when the future part of the book will take place. That's from chapters 4 all the way through 22. But we know that according to God's timetable, the rapture of the church is imminent. It can happen at any moment with no signs. It can happen a week from today. It could happen uh, a thousand years from today. Paul expressed his uh, hope in the imminence of Christ's return when he wrote to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 15. We do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, talking about those who have died, the believers in Christ, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Uh, for this way we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive, you see Paul is expressing his hope that he would be alive for the rapture. He, uh, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. And if you notice here in, in uh, verse 11, there are two kinds of responses uh, when you preach the revelation of Jesus Christ, when you open the book and when you make truth available. The first type of response is uh, rejection. Rejection. 
And that's very clearly here in the uh, 11th verse. When we proclaim the last book of the Bible, uh, people who are already predisposed to, to not believe, people who prefer their sin over salvation in Jesus Christ will dismiss this book as fiction, as non-real or non-literal or a bunch of things that you cannot understand. And as a result, they will go deeper in the filth of their sin. That's what he means by uh, chapter 11. And as a result, they will distance themselves even more from the kingdom of God. And people who do not want to believe the kingdom of God now will not believe the kingdom of God later when there will be physical evidence about that. And the reason we know that, church, is because we studied the response of people in chapter 16 of the book of Revelation, the tribulation uh, people here who will refuse God, but not only that, they will blaspheme God when they see all of the events, the natural phenomena that will happen because of God's judging the earth. They will blaspheme God. But on the other hand, those of us who are saved and therefore are declared righteous because of Christ, because we have the righteousness of Christ, we are declared holy before the Lord, meaning that we have been washed clean, those of us who uh, hear the words of the prophecy of this book are going to want to do, uh, are going to want to grow more in the knowledge of Christ. And uh, that is evident by the fact that this verse encourages us to pursue more holiness, to pursue uh, the, tr the throne of God and being close to Him. Why? Because this, this is what the Word of God does. It sanctifies us. Not only the Word of God saves us, but it sanctifies us, those of us who are believers in Christ. So I hope, church, that you are inspired to proclaim the truths we found in the book of Revelation because the book is not sealed. Even though the canon is closed, which means nothing can be added to it, as we will see here in a moment, but the contents of the book are available to everyone. And the invitation is to all. Whosoever wish may come and take the drink of the water of life, as we will see again in a moment. But there's a second way to be blessed by applying apocalyptic truth, and that is we desire His reward. We desire His reward. Listen to chapter 12, uh, 22, verse 12. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. Now, we've already verified that the return of Christ is near in the economy of God. It could happen, like I said, at any moment. But just uh, Jesus utters the expression, I am coming quickly four times in the book of Revelation. With one variation, I am coming like a thief twice in the book. And the message is clear, church. Don't miss it. The soon-to-take-place return of Christ is the theme of the last book of the Bible, and associated with His return is His promise to recompense believers. And throughout the book of Revelation, we are exposed to what these uh, rewards will be. For example, chapter 2, verse 7, we are promised access to the tree of life. And we saw what the tree of life is like in the, in the last few weeks. Chapter 2, verse 11, we are promised immunity from the second death which is a total separation from God in, in judgment. Chapter 2, also verse 22, and chapter 3, verse 5, we are promised undivided fellowship from Jesus Christ. Also in chapter 3, verse 12, residence in the new Jerusalem, in authority to rule with Him forever, in chapter 3, verse 21. And these are only a few of the promises of reward that we have here. Church, when we get to heaven, those of us who are followers of Christ, he will evaluate the quality of our work. You may have heard the expression, the Bema seat of Christ or the judgment seat of Christ. That is a reference to the evaluation of the work of every believer. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 13. He says this, Now if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. When he writes to the, sec the, the, the second letter to the Corinthians, he says this in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. He's writing to believers, saying that every believer must appear before this judgment seat. It's not the great white throne judgment that we talked about a few weeks ago. This is a different kind of judgment. It's the judgment of our works. It says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad, meaning whether profitable or unprofitable for the body of Christ. So we look forward to heavenly rewards. And the prospect of heavenly rewards should motivate us to serve God even more with more zeal, 
with more determination, with more love and passion, with every ounce of energy that we have. Church, we must employ every talent that you have for the service of the king. Serve him at full potential with all the excellence you can give. Now, we appreciate the recognition of people. Don't get me wrong. We love the accolades of people, the encouragement that comes with that, the affirmation, but ultimately we are after the rewards from our great redeemer and rewarder. And that is very clearly communicated here uh, after we've studied the book of Revelation. So I hope that you are motivated now even more to serve him with all of uh, your strength and to do for him and to employ every talent, every um, ounce of energy that you have. But there's a third way to apply biblical truth or apocalyptic truth here to be blessed by that. And that is we acknowledge his divinity. Listen to verse 13. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Now, three times throughout the book of Revelation, Jesus uses the first and the last letter of the Greek alphabet to identify himself. And uh, here's good homework for you. Try to identify them during the week and, and circle them or highlight them. There's one variation of that in chapter 2, verse uh, 8. Th this is a figure of speech, church. And this communicates the truth of the eternality of Jesus Christ, which means, church, that he is eternal both ways, both in the past and in the future. There has never been a time when Christ did not exist, along with the other two persons of the Trinity. See, Jesus Christ, along with the other two persons of the Trinity, uh, was never created. He is in the divine present forever and ever. And as the Alpha, he was involved in the creation of the universe. Let me give you three references for that. In Genesis 1 verse 26, the Bible says that uh, uh, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. He's using that kind of language because this portion of scripture refers to a conference happening in eternity past when the three persons of the trinity decided to create men in the image of god why because god is triune three in one not three and one that makes four three in one the triune god and jesus christ along with the other members of the trinity is forever he exists forever in the eternal present Listen to the Gospel of John, the prologue, verses 1 through 4 in chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now, if you're not sure who this is talking about, skip over to verse 14 of John 1. And the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us, and we saw His glory, the glory of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Church, who is this talking about? Jesus Christ, the eternal uh, uh, second person of the Trinity, the one who is. He is the Alpha. Here, Paul talks about him also as the Alpha when uh, he was present in creation. In Colossians 1, verse 15, Paul says, Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, which does not mean that he was the first to be created. Church, let get this, let's get this right. It means he is the preeminent one, the one who has primacy over the inheritance of the Father. It says, uh, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, where the thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is the Alpha here because he was involved in creation. But as the Omega, Jesus Christ will be involved in the destruction of the present earth and in the present heavens. Like we saw a few weeks ago, you may remember Revelation 20, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away. And no place was found for them. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. And I hope that you are encouraged when you have a clearer understanding about the divinity of Christ. And we've, saw this, uh, we've seen this very clearly here in the study of the book of Revelation. But there's a fourth way to be blessed by applying apocalyptic truth. And that is we treasure his benevolence. We treasure his benevolence. Listen to verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. If you have the habit of writing in your Bibles uh, like I do, I recommend you write a note there that says, 
the last of the seven Beatitudes of Christ in the book of Revelation. And here's another homework for you, church. Try to find them during the week. See where the other six are. And let me give you a hint. If the sentence begins with the word blessed, it's a good candidate for a Beatitude from Jesus Christ. Now, this is the seventh of the, um, uh, the, the seven Beatitudes in the book. And we have already learned from the book of Revelation that the book of seven symbolizes the, the, the perfection of God. Did we not study that? It, the, the, book of, the number seven represents divine perfection. So the message is very clear here, church. It's impossible to miss. This is a book of blessing. The book of Revelation uh, contains blessings from God, even though we see images of persecution, satanic oppression, demonic activity, utter destruction, fire and brimstone, the benevolence of God is sprinkled throughout the book and it's impossible to miss because it's virtually all over the place. Why? Because it's, God is always blessing us. God is always reminding us that we are blessed to study the, the program that He has for eternity. And He invites people to come to Him all over the book here. But what does it mean to wash one's robe? That's the question here in this verse. Blessed are those who wash their robes. What does that mean? Now, remember chapter 3, verse 4, when writing to the dead church, Jesus Christ said, you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Now, here's how you understand this. Draw a line connecting verse 24, I mean, yeah, verse 14 with verse uh, 11. And you understand that the people who wash their robes are people who are no longer condemned or controlled by the filth of their sin. These are the folks who did not prefer uh, to, to, to roll around in their sin, in the filth of their sin. These are people who wanted to be washed. And they come to Jesus Christ for that and they have been sanctified and purified. And they are blessed because they are no longer condemned by their sin. They are no longer controlled by their sin. And friend, if you are a believer in Christ, you are no longer condemned by your sin, but also you are no longer controlled by your sin. Did you know that? You have the option of sinning no more. Well, of whatever sin that you have, it doesn't mean you will be sinless in this life. Remember, I've been saying this over and over again. You will never be sinless in this life, but you are able to sin less in this life. Why? Because the progress of sanctification in your life, He began a good work in you. So we are blessed, those of us who have come to Jesus Christ by His grace. And we, uh, th this is a beautiful picture, picture here. We have washed our robes. Now, and after reading this book, so I hope that you will learn to treasure His benevolence towards you in including you in the family and purifying you. But there's a fifth way to be blessed by applying apocalyptic truth. And according to verse 15, that is, we revere His holiness. We revere His holiness. Listen to the verse. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. Now, the book of Revelation warns, not only here but in other places, about the danger of being excluded from heaven, church. Now, did you know that according to biblical truth, not everyone will make it to heaven? I hope that's not a surprise for you. That's a heresy called universalism. In the end, God is going to take everyone to heaven. That's just not true according to what the Bible says. There will be people who will be left out because they will prefer their sin. The people who will prefer the, the, the lying. They love the practice of lying, the Bible says here. They didn't love the truth. They preferred to follow a lie. And the lie is that God, one of these lies is that God will take everyone to heaven. No, that insults the character of God. That heresy called universalism. Why? Because it, it, it diminishes the holiness of God. Now listen to chapter 21 verse 8. For the cowardly and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and liars. Their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. Which is the second death. Also chapter 21 verse 27 says nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it. But only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, what does this mean, church? It means that these, these are not people who have never committed these things. These are folks who are washed from these things. These are folks whose lives are not, no longer characterized by those sins. Now, again, the Bible says that God is holy. 
Not only that, God is holy, holy, holy. We saw that in Revelation 4, verse 8. And because God is holy, he must punish sin. You see, a judge would be corrupt if he didn't punish sin, if he didn't condemn sinners or, or criminals to jail. How much more uh, does the notion of universalism, for example, insult the character of God? Because God is holy, he must hate sin. And that's the truth that we see, we've seen over and over here in the book of Revelation. Now, the kingdom of God is therefore exclusive to those who used to be idolaters, used to be murderers and liars, basically all of us, but we have now been washed clean because we recognize our sinfulness and we came to Christ for salvation. There's no merit in us because God has done all the work. Now, the term dogs here, I want you to know, does not refer to pets, so relax. Uh, that does not mean your cocker spaniel will not be in heaven. It doesn't mean your, your cat won't be there, although I have my doubts about cats in heaven. <laughs> now, because before you say, how can there be heaven without dogs, right? Now, remember, this is a figure of speech. This, these dogs, re, re, uh, they refer, they symbolize a kind of people. But what kind of people? Again, draw a line from this verse and pointing to verse 11, and you will understand the meaning of that metaphor, because the answer is in the text. Now, the immediate context explains to us. Um, the, John is referring to here, or, or not John, uh, the, when he's recording the revelation, he's referring to wild dogs, scavengers, rummaging through uh, the garbage dumps outside the city walls during the time that, this, uh, that, that John is recording these words. Now, these are the, 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 the dogs who roll around in sin. They, 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 they roll around in filth and in garbage. And, and this, the comparison is with people who prefer their sins over the purification that comes from Christ. Paul uses a similar metaphor in Philippians 3 verse 2. Beware of the dogs, he says. He's not talking about beware of animals or pets. Beware of the dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the false circumcisions. Basically, be, beware of these people who s s teach false doctrine, in, one, in case of Paul here. So I hope, church, that in your study, in our study of the book of Revelation, God has caused you to look at His holiness with fresh eyes so that you understand the holiness of God and you, under you see your sin the same way He sees your sin. Because God hates sin, now we must hate our sin as well. And we go to Him in repentance periodically and ask Him to clean us, to wash us, and to forgive us of our uh, post-conversion sins that we all commit. Because He is holy. See, uh, in our, it's not re very politically correct to use the word sin in our day. But the, the Bible talks about it all over the place. If we're going to avoid this uncomfortable subject, again, we need to rip out pages and pages from our Bible. We're not going to do that because this is dereliction of duty. But there's a sixth way to be blessed by applying apocalyptic truth, and that is we understand his identity according to verse 16. Now, this is direct speech from Christ. He says this, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Now, John described direct speech from Jesus Christ in other places here in the book. More evident, for example, in chapters 2 through 3 when he addresses the seven churches in Asia. But here, Jesus is signing off on the book, indicating that he is the revealer. And he does this to confirm that everything that we've studied so far is a product of divine revelation. These are not the, these are not the product of John's research. See, people may have accused John, and they could have accused John, of plagiarizing the visions of the throne from the book of Daniel, Isaiah, and Ezekiel. But the book here confirms, no, 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 this is divine revelation. This doesn't come from John. These are not his hallucinations. These are not the product of his research. This is my book. Jesus Christ is saying, because this is the revelation of Christ, from Christ, and about Christ. And he also clarifies his messianic credentials. Did you notice that? When he quotes Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, and also Numbers 24, 17, linking the book of Revelation with Old Testament uh, revelation. And um, perhaps there were some Jewish believers in the churches in the, in the beginning of the book, the churches in Asia. But the question is, how can Jesus be at the same time the root and the descendant of David? And the answer is, church, because he is divine, because he is the God-man. He is the bright morning star, the God-man, the Son of God, or God the Son. 
And we are blessed to understand that mystery that many people miss. Many of the cults are not blessed because they miss this truth about the identity of Christ. He is not 50% God, 50% man. He is 100% God, 100% man. That's the hypostatic union, to use seminary language for this. It's undivine, uh, undiminished deity and perfect humanity combined into the same person. We have been exposed to the identity of Jesus Christ here, and we understand that. Therefore, we are blessed. Because we know in whom we have believed. And unfortunately, many people miss that reality because they uh, bought into a lie about the, the identity of Christ. Folks will knock on your door and try to convince you that Jesus Christ is not divine or they, he is less divine than the Father. Don't you believe it because that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says Jesus Christ is divine and human. He is the God-man, the Son of God. 100% God, 100% man at the same time. It doesn't make sense mathematically, but it does theologically, does it not? But here's a seventh way to be blessed. By applying apocalyptic truth, we reproduce his kindness. Listen to verse 17. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes to take the water of life let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. Now, again, invitations are many in the book of Revelation. Uh, again, a good uh, exercise is for you to go dig them up here. But perhaps the most common one you will find is this. In uh, virtually to every church in the first two chapters of the book. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And what we have here, church, is God's last call in written format for people to come to him. And we reproduce this kindness, the kindness of God. Now, some people believe that the first come here is addressed to Jesus Christ, inviting him to come. But I don't think that's the case. I think it's better to understand this as the bride of Christ, the church, right? That's why we have this image here, the bride of Christ, the church, along with the power of the Holy Spirit, inviting people to come because that is our mission. The mission of the church is to invite people to come to Jesus Christ. We saw that in all four Gospels, what we call the Great Commission. And I said this last time, the Great Commission is not the awesome suggestion. It's the Great Commission, which means it's our mission. It's what we're supposed to do. But we don't do it in the power of our own eloquence because otherwise we will fall on our faces. And like I used to, uh, like to say here, we will um, step on a spiritual banana peel when we try to do this on our own. But we do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why the Spirit and the Bride say together, Come, sinners, come. Come to Jesus Christ. Embrace Him as your Savior. We, therefore, uh, extend the kindness of God in the person of Jesus Christ. You don't have to have a, theology, uh, the, uh, a degree in theology in order to invite people to come to Christ. All you have to do is kindly, faithfully invite people to come to Jesus Christ and tell them what He's done in your life. And we invite people to come and take the drink of the, the water of life. We imitate the kindness of God by extending his call to sinners to come and be saved. We are beggars telling other beggars where to quench their spiritual thirst. And those who hear the words of the prophecy and come to Christ are to join in a mission right away. Again, church, let me remind you of our mission. We are not a political force. The reason why we exist is not to be a social club, a glorified social club, but we are ambassadors of Christ. We are issuing the invitation for sinners to come. And we echo the warning. If you don't come, the consequence is you will spend eternity away from God in a place called the lake of fire. But there's an eighth way to be blessed by applying apocalyptic truth. And that is in verses 18 through 19, we honor his word. We honor his word. Listen to this. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in the book. And if anyone takes away from the words of uh, the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree and from the holy city which are written in this book. Now church, let me tell you what this is not. This is not a warning against people who don't understand the book of Revelation, okay? So relax, otherwise all of us would be doomed. 
this is not a threat for you to lose your salvation if you don't understand the book of Revelation. That's just not a, the character of God. This is a warning against false teachers who like to add to and subtract from the word of God. The oldest trick in the book, false teachers have been doing this from the beginning of time. And their hallmark and their number one way to identify them is by noting that they, they, they subtract to or they add to the word of God. They distort scripture. It's usually in the form of taking verses out of context, yanking them out of their context, and building a whole system on one or two verses that have nothing to do with their original context. Church, that is the reason why we study every book of the Bible word for word so we don't miss the context. Because it's easy to build a whole philosophy around one or two verses and say what, whatever you want to say and find Bible verses to back up what you want to say. That's a warning against, against these guys here. That we, we, true believers of Christ would never do that. True followers of Christ honor the words of the Bible here. In fact, we would never disrespect the Word of God. We treasure the Word of God because it's, our, it's alive and, and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's our spiritual food. We are nourished by it. We are sanctified, not only saved and sanctified, but we are satisfied by the word of God, are we not? And we do like the psalmist does in Psalm 119 with the word of God. He says this, Your word have I treasured in my heart, that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have told of the ordinances of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate in your precepts and regard your ways. I shall delight I shall delight in your statutes. I shall not forget your word. See, that describes a true follower of Christ who desires the word of God more than gold, more than food. Because this is the water of life. We learn about him. So I hope that your study of Revelation has rekindled and refueled your passion for the word of God. But there's a ninth way to be blessed. By applying apocalyptic truth, and that is, according to verse 20, we crave his return. We crave his return. Listen to the verse, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. You see, once again, we hear uh, Jesus reminding us of the imminence of his return for his bride, for his church. That could happen at any moment. He says, I am coming quickly, which means it, it, without delay. It could be at any time. Be ready. Stay ready because today could be the day. It will it, happen within a, the blinking of an eye. It could happen in centuries from our perspective. But from God who is outside time, it can happen at any moment. And notice the inserted comment that John uh, puts here. Uh, amen. He says, truly. That, that is true. He is uh, uh, declaring that these words are true. He is uh, agreeing with God. He's saying, yes, that is true. And he then... Uh, expresses here the aspiration of every believer. Come, Lord Jesus Christ. We desire to be with you. Basically, that's what is uh, this uh, last portion of this verse is saying. We desire to be with you face to face. We are aware of the fact that we have much to do here in the meantime. We love our life here. We love our church, our family, our work. But we desire to be with you ultimately because what Paul says to be with Christ is far better for me to, li to live as Christ, but to die is gain. Why? Because we will be with him forever, those who will experience physical death. But there might be some here who will not experience physical death and will be raptured like that if the Lord comes within the next two decades or three decades or so. We can't put a date on it. People have tried that and failed miserably. So because they're doing exactly what the Bible condemns, they're adding to Scripture. We don't know. So we need to be ready. And we crave his return. And I hope that our study of the book of Revelation has aroused that hope in your life to see Jesus Christ face to face because the Bible says we will see him as he is. We will see him face to face and we will interact with him. And, and like Job says, in my flesh I will see God. That's because of the resurrection or the transformation of our bodies that's going to take place. But there's a tenth way and the final one here in our study. Uh, to be blessed by applying apocalyptic truth, we announce his grace. Listen to the very last sentence of the Bible, church. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. The very last word of the Bible is amen. And it testifies that God's grace towards fallen humanity. See, the Bible starts with creation and ends with redemption and salvation. Uh, the invitation, therefore, goes to all 
Whoever wishes to take of the water of life, uh, in verse 17, there is no cost. We understand that because salvation is a free gift of God. You cannot work for it. And you don't deserve it because of your sinfulness. Same thing with me because of my sinfulness. We do not deserve salvation. It's only by the grace of God. But the last sentence of the Bible here is, is, is a benediction. It's proclamation. It's, it's a proclamation of the grace of God. It's uh, John's desire that the grace of God be with all. Now, church, this is God's love letter to you. In this book, you will know how to be made right with God, how to be restored, how to have your hope renovated, how to have your love for him rekindled, your passion for him uh, recovered, and also your love for unsaved folks. Now, to quote John again in chapter 1, verse 16, we learn that from the fullness of his grace, we have received one blessing after another. Do you realize, church, how blessed we are that we get to study these things and we are freed from persecution and we are able to study these uh, truths openly and we are able to rejoice in them and we are able to proclaim them and, and talk about them and rejoice in them. The book of Revelation is one of the most practical books in the Bible. Don't let anybody tell you that there is no practicality in studying prophecy or studying apocalyptic truth because we just saw that that's not the case. We just point out 10 ways to be blessed because of the promise of the book in the beginning. Blessed are those who study the book of Revelation. So we have been blessed, church, in the last year and a half of the, for however long, we, 47 weeks with a few breaks in between for our summer series. And what do we do now? So what do we do that we, we've studied every word of the book of Revelation from beginning to end? What do we do? We do it again with another book. And that's what we're going to do next week. We're going to start our study of Ruth. Now, I haven't uh, used shampoo products for a long time, as you may notice. <laughs> but in the back of that, your shampoo, it says here, do this, this, and this, and repeat the process. Do this, this, and this, and repeat the process. So church, starting next week, we're going to repeat the process. We're going to be blessed by studying the story of Ruth. And what a, what a great time for our church here to be blessed by the word of God and to grow by it and to be sanctified and satisfied by it. I hope that your love for him has been rekindled. I hope you're on fire for him. Don't let the, uh, the, 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 your passion for him burn out because of the difficulties of life. Keep your eyes on him. Keep your focus on the book because this is God's love letter to you. And in that love letter, sometimes you will be confronted with the reality of your sin, perhaps. Sometimes you will be comforted. Because this book here, like I heard another pastor say many times, it comforts the afflicted, but afflicts the comfortable. Because it's the word of God. So church, let's pray and let's uh, expect great fruit from our study of the word of God, verse by verse. And I hope again to be doing this again, maybe in a few decades, just to go over the book again. Instead of 47 times, we'll do it 100 times. Just to pick up, because I will have grown in my knowledge uh, of the book too. So let's pray together. Father, thank you uh, for your great love for us. Thank you for the fact that we can study the Word of God and be blessed by it. We just saw ten ways to apply biblical truth found in the book of Revelation, the summary of truth here, Lord. So I pray, Lord, that as we go back to our homes today and this week, Lord, uh, you will bring to our remembrance all of these things, Father, and we will find ways to honor you even more. Lord, thank you for such a great church to be a part of, a church that honors you, a church that wants to uh, uh, glorify you in everything we do. Lord, I'm so inspired by my fellow believers here, Lord, and I pray, Lord, that we will be faithful even more to our commitment to honor you in everything we do and to reach people for Christ. Oh, Lord, may the gospel never leave its central place in this church, Lord, may we always honor your word, Lord, more than we honor people. May we always honor the gospel by living the truth of the gospel, Lord, in a way that uh, you will be honored and glorified, Lord, by uh, looking at our lives, Lord. And as a result, this will open many doors for gospel proclamation, many doors for people to hear the truth of the word of God, Lord. We love you. We want to honor you, Father. And we pray um, for my, br my brothers and sisters here, Lord, who may be struggling. Father, to find joy. They may be struggling to find hope, 
Lord, because of the pressures of this life, because of the heartaches of this life, Lord. But I pray, Father, that we will all collectively look towards heaven and desire the time when sorrow will be no more, desire the time when separation will be gone, desire the time when sin uh, will not affect us anymore, Lord. But in the meantime, Lord, we love you and we thank you because we have the joy of the Lord that keeps us going, Lord, and the hope that is within us. It is our blessed hope, Lord, and you teach us according to your word, uh, Father, to live in this way, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.